the charity basketball. Whose idea was it? Um, I've been playing in pickup leagues in Montreal for the last probably seven years, and uh, there's a guy in Little Burgundy named Dexter uh, who played at Concordia. He's uh, he's the all-time leading scorer at Concordia, and uh, he just he runs all these leagues, and he has kids leagues, and then after-school programs for kids in, in that neighborhood. And he's such a gracious kind of great community guy, and uh, but he's been really he's been funding a lot of it out of his basketball leagues to fund the after school programs and I've just been trying to encourage him you know like come on man let's get this together so so uh, this is we're hoping to this year's at McGill on Saturday um, from 3 to 6 or something like that and we're hoping um, it's going to be at McGill and then Concordia kind of alternating years so we're hoping it's going to be an annual event now you're involved you've created a symphony is it a bicycle symphony yeah, it's not properly a symphony. Someone <laughs> threw that word at it, and then okay, so what is it? Saying it. Uh, it's like a multi-channel piece, like composition for kind of moving many speakers, maybe like 15, 16 speakers, attached to um, bicycles and roller skaters, kind of boombox style, um, and kind of different sounds, different voices coming out of every speaker, and they're gonna. It's kind of part of the halftime show of the basketball game. Um, and so what we, inspired it? Uh, well, it's kind of a, a quote from the Book of Revelation, <laughs> and uh, and the kind of in, increasing use um, by the military around the world of um, pilotless drone planes to fight wars instead of people. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so kind of a scary, scary jumping off point, I guess. It's kind of scary, sci-fi, spooky music in the dark with people riding around in black on bikes with flashing lights. So it's a little different from the halftime show at the Lakers <laughs> yeah. game. Yeah, it's a little incongruous maybe for a halftime show, but I figure at worst it'll be unique and cool and weird. So, And kind of part of the idea of the game is it's it's during Pop Montreal and it's called Pop versus Jock. And it's kind of a joke about how a lot of people who are musicians are kind of embarrassed if they're into sports and a lot of guys who are into sports are embarrassed if they're into art. And so the idea was to kind of try and do a fun event that, you know, because I play in a rock band, but I'm really into basketball, and so part of the idea was just to have something that, you know, it's all right <laughs> to like sports, and it's okay to be into art, and so, um, yeah, and, and Richard was just, was thinking about doing it in a gymnasium, and we're just like, man, you just do it at the halftime show, it'll be, you'll have a captive audience, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we first met, Richard did a piece at Concordia, like, many years ago that was kind of a football-themed mm-hmm. thing, but, like, a weird art show, and they had, um, they put turf, like, real grass in the VAV at Concordia. The whole thing was grass, and that was right when we kind of met, and I walked in, and I was like, this is really cool, there's <laughs> grass on the floor in the art gallery, so <laughs> I think, in my mind, it's, it's not too dissimilar from what he was doing before we even started playing music together so it's pretty cool yeah. I, I want to ask about your involvement in charities I mean you've been you've all been very involved in fundraising and also you know to stand in the VIP section tomorrow um, people have to donate to a charity as well why is that important to you well I mean for the most part we've um, been doing fundraising for Haiti I mean even before the earthquake um, and so the kind of we, we took a trip as a band to Haiti uh, earlier this year, and it was one of the most incredible. We played music there, and we played about two hours north of Port-au-Prince and brought in a sound system. And um, so, I don't know, we have a really deep connection to that country. And this, the idea for this is, was to do um, something with a local charity. This guy, Dexter, someone I know locally who's just really involved in kids' lives and just trying to do something that's that's... You know, local as well, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I mean we're really in a fortunate position as a band, and so I think it's extra important to like take to heart that good fortune and um, kind of try and help other people. But I think it's just as a person, especially a person like in the Western world, it's really important to realize that no matter how not in great shape you are, you're actually like in amazing shape compared to most of the people in the world and to just try and like just any kind of gesture of, of generosity that anyone can do um, kind of goes a lot further than it feels like it might so like the, the 
the organization that we do a ton of fundraising for, Partners in Hell, um, like the, by far the bulk of the money that comes into them is actually just like in the people donating like twenty to one hundred dollars category. Even though there's like you know corporate donors that'll give huge chunks of money, but still the bulk of what they run off of is that. It's just like the little tiny efforts that people can do who don't like necessarily have a lot of money, but they can just give a tiny bit, and that's pretty powerful when you stop and think about it. And we're, I mean, we're we play in a rock band, so. We're familiar, you know, when our band first came out, there's a lot of excitement and there's like kind of this movement of energy and people that kind of comes together. And we've very much felt that way about Partners in Health because, I mean, if there's like a punk rock healthcare organization, it's Partners in Health, you know. And so we're kind of, I almost feel like a fan. Paul, Paul Farmer, who founded that organization, is in town and doing some events with Regine. And to me, I mean, he's like, Paul Farmer's up there with anyone in the world that I'd want to meet and want to, you know, be around just because he just really laid down a challenge, I think, to to people in the West, you know, the idea that healthcare is actually a human right um, and that, you know, you shouldn't have to die like a lot of people in, in the earthquake in Haiti died from not having tetanus shots, you know, like, I don't know, 15,000 people. And it's a really tough thing to say people should die because you can't have a shot that costs five cents, you know? It's like, it's, it, there's a kind of inherent, you know, there's an inher- inherently something wrong with that way of thinking, so. Now, um, so we, we're bridging into sort of the people in the VIP section to where I want to ask, what made you guys decide to do a big free outdoor show at Plastic Festival? How much convincing did it take? Was it Pop Montreal's idea, yours? Uh, it's, we kind of, Tossed around the idea of doing something free for a long time. It's just like that. Wouldn't that be a nice way to end? And we started this whole tour like with a free outdoor show here, and now we're a lot better than we were then. <laughs> After a year and a half of, of touring the world, um, I don't know. It just seemed kind of like a nice gesture to kind of come full circle to where it starts and end it there, and then we can bike home at the end of the night and go to bed in our own beds. And that's like become the greatest luxury in life. <laughs> and also, uh, whenever we play. Montreal, like half of half of the energy of doing a show is putting all your friends on the guest list, and when it's free, it's like <laughs> it's free. Just come. <laughs> the whole city is on your guest. List. Yeah, the whole city is on the guest list. So just plus one. Go downtown, walk downtown, and you're on the list. I want to ask, can you sort of sum up for what the last past year has been like? You know, you said it's like coming to the end. What has it been like for you? Uh, <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah, not really. Not really. You can't really sum it up. It is, it's a lot. It's a lot of information and a lot of moving around and a lot of fun and a lot of difficult and had to be there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've been watching you. <laughs> yeah. So what's it been like? Yeah. yeah. It's you become tell. amazing to watch. Like yeah. watching the Grammys. It was. It was an amazing experience. Pretty much like that. It's like it's kind of like watching it. Only the colors are a little bit brighter, <laughs> and you're a little more underslept. <laughs> it's like watching it on TV because I'm more tired. <laughs> um, my colleagues at the Toronto Arts Unit are doing a piece for this weekend on the 20th anniversary of Nirvana's Nevermind, and they wanted to know um, where you think Kurt Cobain would be in the music world. Um, if you were still alive today with how the music world has changed? I don't know. I mean, he's definitely on that list of people that includes John Lennon and Joe Strummer that on a pretty regular basis, I'll, you know, my kind of thoughts will turn to him just because he really captured something really pure and really deep um, that made it to this kind of popular level that, that only happens every once, every however long. So, um, I don't know. I... I know that it's better to be alive, you know, like, so I wish, you know, I wish it would be great if he was alive. I'm curious about the pressures from going from indie to that kind of extreme popularity, which is what he went through and what you guys went through as well. Yeah, no drugs, so that's, every day I thank, thank the Lord that no one in the band is, like, because dealing with, dealing with just what you have to deal with on a daily basis. Being in a big band is kind of enough, you know. So it's kind of hard enough. But, uh, 
So, yeah, and we weren't like we weren't like 16 when our band got popular. We'd been in a lot of different bands, and I think we had our head on our shoulders pretty well. Um, I don't know. We're we're surrounded by a lot of great people too. And we have a lot of great people working for us, and, um, and there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us, which is actually a big thing. It's also it's a balance of men and women in our band, which actually. I routinely forget how big of a difference that makes, but then you like play with a band that's just all dudes, and you're like, "Oh, I'm so glad we're not just a bunch of dudes." <laughs> wow, <laughs> like really, it really changes things. Yeah, that's. I mean, women in rock in general, it's like a very, it's been a very slow progression, and I feel like, you know, Regine, I'm, I'm married to her, but there's not every day I see her do something musical and it just kind of blows me away, you know. So I think that. I feel like we're kind of almost the first generation that's really had men and women in bands as like total equals, and that's something that's really exciting too. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it.